Okay, good evening, good morning for our friends overseas. Welcome to the reflection on Western Balkan Geopolitics Forum. My name is Dr. Medin, the Republic Party. Today we are honored to be joined by an excellent panel of great generals and politicians from both sides of Atlantic, United States, UK, and European Union. Just a few decades ago, the Western Balkans were shaken by wars, atrocities, genocides, and ethnic cleansing at a scale, which were considered impossible in post-World War II Europe. All these things served as a lesson that peace and democracy are every day better and not just a destination or a dream. A lesson that sadly today seems to be forgotten and seems to be questioned every day. The geopolitics in the Balkan has changed a lot. The vacuum created by United States and EU in last years is filled with influence and presence of Russia and China in many aspects. While Russia has strong influence in Serbia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Montenegro, they have extended as well their military, intelligence, economic, and media presence. China has become a very important economic factor an actor with investment on the key sectors such technology, infrastructure, and energy that are well connected with our security. The initiative 17 plus one led by China is very active and involves not just Western Balkan countries, but European Union members as well. Most of the leaders in the Balkans are eager to follow and implement mostly Chinese Russian or Turkish style of strongman government, as the House of Lords duly noted in their 2018 report, quote, open quote, countries in the Western Balkans region are turning to authoritarian leadership, nationalistic politics and state culture, close quote. The people that stood against their dictatorial and authoritarian governments today seems to accept the regress of democracy. Most of the young and active people are massively fleeing the region to the European Union countries through employment programs, but also as asylum seekers, creating a big political, social and economic problem for the present and the future of our countries and our region. The West, in my belief, cannot afford to continue this politics, thinking that the problem will go away on its own or that the sole aspiration of joining the EU is sufficient to keep the region a path to higher democracy standards. It is evident today that authoritarian corrupt leaders and state culture is leading to a long term of destabilization. It is my strong belief that facing this disruption from China and Russia, the EU and US cannot afford to have instability in the region and lack of influence in the Balkans. Now uh, I will go to uh, my good friend, David Phillips. David uh, is a really a good friend for a long time. He is a director of peace building and human rights program of Columbia University. David served for more than a decade at the US Department of State with President Bush, Clinton and Obama. And also he served in Council of Foreign Relations he is the author of the several excellent policy papers and hundreds of articles in leading publications such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, International Herald Tribune, and Foreign Affairs. He is a great friend and never gave up on us with a lot of patience as friends do. He has held several conferences about the region helping us to better comprehend the challenges that peace and stability are facing in our region from American perspective. David also worked in supporting President-elect Biden in last elections and advised him on Balkan policies. So David, my question for you is, as you have been involved in the Balkans for a long time, in the region as well, and you have known personally most of the political leaders, and as Albanians, we are really thankful to your friendship. You have followed also closely the Kosovo issue and Albanian, Albanian 
uh, Albanian membership in NATO. With new US administration, what will change in the Balkans? And how do you see the situation in Albanian cost? Latest changes in the region, especially NATO, EU, and other influences like Russia, China, Turkey, and other foreign actors. Thank you very much, Fatmir. It's great to be a part of the panel. Uh, this is a very happy day in the United States. We've undertaken regime change through elections, and that process is going to restore closer cooperation between the U.S. And, and on Albanian issues in Albania and in Kosovo. President-elect Biden has a long history of friendship and cooperation uh, with Albanians. He was an outspoken critic of Slobodan Milosevic's aggression in Bosnia, led efforts to lift the arms embargo. He introduced the 1999 resolution authorizing the use of force against Yugoslav armed forces. He also worked multilaterally to uh, cooperate more closely with NATO uh, during the intervention. And we can expect from a Biden administration a more proactive and balanced approach uh, in the Balkans. When it comes to Kosovo, uh, we look for him to reverse Trump's pro-Serbian bias. Uh, he will work closely with the EU, emphasizing transatlantic cooperation. Uh, we heard of, from other panelists about the importance of the uh, Brussels dialogue. Uh, it is important that that dialogue be based on certain principles. Normalization to me means independence for Kosovo, preserving its territorial integrity. There are also other agenda items that we'll see as a priority for a Biden administration. Having justice for war crimes, providing an accounting of missing persons, and of course, if the EU is going to be an effective mediator, it is to prove its goodwill through visa liberalization for Kosovo passport holders, which is long overdue. And surely we want to see Kosovo's SAA advanced. When it comes to Albania, uh, Senator Biden was active uh, in supporting democracy there. Uh, in the future, we can expect increased and growing defense cooperation between the U.S. and Albania. Uh, a Biden administration will seek to expand economic and trade relations with Albania. We also want to see Albania make progress towards its EU membership. But of course, those need to be based on specific criteria, specific benchmarks regarding the rule of law, cracking down on corruption, on electoral reforms, uh, these details are important, but the overarching message has to do with U.S. Uh, friendship with Albanians. Uh, the American people have no better friend anywhere in the world than the Albanian people. Uh, during the past several years, this friendship has suffered as a result of the Trump administration's tilt towards Belgrade. We'll see a level playing field and that friendship and cooperation restored. And we look forward to uh, being actively engaged in moving Albania's democracy forward and also seeing Kosovo and Serbia normalize their relations based on mutual recognition and Kosovo's territorial integrity. So thank you very much, Fatmir. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, David. I do appreciate very much. Now, the next question goes to David Phillips from Eriolakic. Thank you, Mr. Medio. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for being here and for sharing with us your opinions, but not only your meaningful experience as well, enabling us to better understand the geopolitics in the region. Let me introduce myself. I am Ariola Lakechi. Uh, currently, I am Deputy Dean for Research at the Faculty of Professional Studies, Duras University. I hold a PhD in conservation biology in Albania and postdoc in international maritime uh, law and policies in Italy. Um, 
before Ms. Bonfrisco mentioned the importance of the dialogue between Serbia and Kosovo from the EU point of view. Indeed, I consider this an important topic, but as well sensitive. And remaining to this topic, I would like to ask you, what do you think about the agreement between Serbia and Kosovo signed in the White House? And what's your opinion on how the new administration will follow up this? Thank you. David? So thanks very much for that question. I don't thank think you, it's thank correct, you. I don't think it's correct to use the term agreement uh, because there was no paper that was signed jointly by the government of Kosovo and the Serbian government. Uh, there was an agreement reached in Washington for uh, Kosovo and Israel to normalize their diplomatic relations. Other than that, there were a series of signatures on political statements made by uh, Prime Minister Hoti and others, but there was no agreement between the parties. Any agreement that we saw on economic normalization was merely a rehash of previous agreements. Uh, and the idea of economic cooperation uh, is usually advantageous towards Serbia. Uh, it opens up rail and road transport and port access. Kosovo will benefit merely by receiving transit fees. So if we're serious about regional economic development, we have to look at investment, job creation, and other ways where economic activity can be undertaken that is to everyone's benefit. Short of that, there was no real significant agreement with just political statements. In fact, I view that those political statements were engineered by the United States largely as a campaign maneuver. So it's important that now the US reinvigorate its mediation role, that it work more closely with European counterparts and that we focus on real agreements that are beneficial to Kosovo as well as to Serbia. Uh, without that, we're not going to see progress in the region. Thank you very much, David. I will appreciate if you keep going. So the next uh, question is addressed by to my good friend David Phillips from Edison Mecheme. Thank you, Mr. Nadeau. Greetings. We are all, thank you very much for your presence here in this critical situation. I am Edison Metemea. I've studied political science, specialized in international relations, as well as international business and European affairs. Mr. Phillips, as an international relations fellow, it's my honor to address you this question. We would like to know what will be and should be the position of the new U.S. administration towards the Balkans in the light of this discussion, considering the involvement of foreign actors in the region. So a concern uh, is Turkey's posture in the region. We've seen that uh, President Erdogan has been pursuing a neo-Ottoman agenda. He's been acquiring assets. He's also adopted uh, an Islamist and anti-Western approach. So we hope that uh, Turkey can be brought back into the tent. But we also recognize that Turkey right now is going through very trying economic circumstances. Uh, it's 8.5 lira to the dollar. Cabinet members are being replaced routinely. And until Turkey is able to stabilize its economy and adopt more pro-Western values, it remains a threat to uh, countries in the region. And I hope that the US can work more constructively with Turkey, but it needs to be based on some international standards. And so far, Erdogan hasn't shown any commitment to those standards. If anything, he's shown a disdain and disregard for them. So when it comes to Turkey, we have our work cut out for us. Thank you very much, David. We all need, you know, Turkey as a NATO partner with all the standards that are needed, strong Turkey can be of great help. 
you know, that have the right agenda and work with the uh, US and the European Union and the Balkan countries forward. And to conclude, my aim was to bring some young people to talk about security. Security, in my belief, is very important for every citizen, but especially the understanding of young, young people of a NATO country. So we can put our priorities right, where it starts. And one lesson learned for me is that security is never for granted, it's never cheap. And as we talk here, and I want to, let's say, conclude with some of uh, the ideas here, I want to add one important point when we talk about bipolar or malignant behavior of Russia. The three C's initiative supported by American administration, EU countries, that includes a lot of European countries and also European Balkan countries should continue and should be supported. And people should get the understanding of the importance of it. And the corridor from north south, starting from the Baltic Sea, Black Sea to Mediterranean, that includes investment on infrastructure, technology, and also energy, which are crucial to our economic development, but also to our security. So saying that, I think that uh, governments of the Balkans should insist to become part of this initiative, not just to be part to watch and listen, but to be engaged on the project and contribute to this common goal of building a future Europe together. Also, I think another lesson taken from here is that we should behave <clears throat> as NATO country and also as European prospective country. It is no question that stability without democracy cannot exist. Democracy without free and fair election where people have their voice and decide with their votes cannot exist. So we should go to the right way of building our nation, our state and our European future. Give the people the chance for free and a fair election. The ones that try to put their hands and control the life of the people, control the elections are not for people. They are for themselves and the enemies of democracy. We need strong United States. We need strong United Kingdom. We need strong European Union presence and leadership around the world, but also attention in the Balkans. So I want to thank Lord Richards, General Wall, General Weller, my good friend David Phillips, Anna Bonfrisco, George Saratelli, all participants for this very encouraging and great meeting we had today and looking forward for the next meeting in the future. So may God bless you all and thank you very much for this wonderful event we organized today. Thank you. So thanks to you all. We'll Goodbye, thank you. It was a great discussion. Yeah, great to be with all of you. General Wald, General uh, Lord Richards, General Willer, David, Anna, it is a great, and George is a great pleasure. Let's see thank you. the next step. Love you all and all the best to you and to your families. Thank you very much. Best the best to you all. Thank you very much.